This is Driftwood by John Cleworth. A vast, barren expanse, pockmarked with innumerable rocks and chunks of driftwood, stretched out for miles before and behind him. He empathized with the driftwood, and he was not entirely uncomfortable with the thought. In a way, it reassured him. At last, he had given up control of his life and opted to let fate direct him, like the tides. A light breeze had evolved into a bluster and carried surface sand up the beach toward him like a ghostly cloud of gas. He was unaware of this. He looked neither forward at the soulless sand nor back at his dogging prints. He only looked downward at his own footfalls. Occasionally his boots would crunch over multicolored pebbles, rounded by years of sea stroking. But mostly he felt the soft yield of the golden sand. Though he looked down, his senses seemed intensified. Strange that he should feel so alive today. The cliffs rose to his left, as if wishing to block the exit from the incoming tide, which insinuated in with coiling waves and hissing tongues. Directly ahead of him lay what looked like a large latex spearheaded glove with too many fingers. He stopped, bent forward to give it a closer inspection. A young dead squid, motionless, rubbery, and beginning to stink like a lifeless fetus left out in the heat. His mind flashed back to Angelica, so pulsating in life, so frighteningly tragic in death. He and Angelica had planned to have a family in a couple years' time, but they'd bled her out with a razor to her throat, left her there for him to find on his own doorstep. All for her purse and the price of their latest fix. He'd gladly have given them a thousand times its worth just to have had them leave her alive. He kicked the squid to one side and walked on, desolate. Springtime was trying to force back the doors of winter with little success. The weather was changeable, shifting quicker than the tides. Brief, clear blue skies had given way to gray clouds, which were already succumbing to threats from ominous black thunderheads on the horizon. The growing chill in the air did not infiltrate Stockwell's body. His mind, his soul, seemed to have detached itself from his physical being, remaining attached only by the flimsiest thread. As he plodded on like a nomad in exile, He knew the one thing he still had control over in his life. And that was the power to end it. The sea edged closer. Its sound growing louder. The smell more pungent. Stockwell, eyes downcast, walked on. Boots crunching down on a razor shell. His hand, hidden deep in his right coat pocket, closed more tightly around the cutthroat razor. His thumb slid up and down the mother-of-pearl handle. It was as if his subconscious countdown to suicide had come to an abrupt halt. A seagull cried overhead, at once lonely, yet mocking. His eyes turned skyward to watch the bird as it wheeled and flapped like a kite with a severed string. And again he visualized the thread that held his soul to this sad, pathetic body. To this sick, cruel world. A year to the day, and the police still hadn't caught the bestial group who had terminated the life of his soulmate. He couldn't even weep now. He withdrew his hand from his pocket, closed his eyes, opened the lethal blade of the razor. He raised the live edge to his stubble-covered neck. 
a distant corner of his mind mused that he must have made a comical sight. Standing in the middle of a deserted beach, apparently ready to shave, the cold steel kissed the left side of his throat. In a moment, he would apply the requisite pressure to open the soft flesh, draw blood, and slice across the trachea. Then it would all be over, and the blissful release would envelop him. He pressed his hand steady as a rock, felt his lifeblood begin to seep from him. Now was the time to draw the blade sideways. A smile flickered across the corner of his lips for the first time in 12 months. And then he heard the moan. He froze, hands still gripping the razor, eyes closed. There it was again, just a few feet ahead. His eyes snapped open and focused on the origin of the sound. What his eyes conveyed to his brain left him stunned. There in front of him, surrounded by a circle of sandcastle, was a severed head. The severed head groaned. His blood ran cold as the eyes of the head rolled in his direction. Red streaked eyes, banded by gray-black bags. Those eyes held pleading. Help me. Help me. The voice was frightened, hoarse. Strange thoughts reeled within Stockwell's brain. How could this be? Had his mind collapsed entirely? Who are you, he found himself saying. Good God, not only am I hearing voices from a decapitated head, I'm entering into a conversation with it. He flopped to the ground, sitting cross-legged, staring at the bizarre head. From the clifftop, secreted amidst the thick foliage of bushes, a figure lay belly down on the ground. The watcher's eyes moved over the scene unfolding on the beach. Sweat beaded on his brow, his heart thumped within his chest. This was not supposed to be happening. He had rehearsed this scenario so many times in his mind, had set the stage so very carefully with such utter precision. His prey looked so comically ridiculous. The video camera in the thicket beside him recorded every glorious moment, and now the whole climax was threatened. The beach was always deserted at this time in the morning. He had observed day in, day out, for months now. So who was this sad-looking stranger? Why was he walking on the beach? And what was he doing sitting beside his victim, apparently speaking? Please, I'm, I'm Tony. Tony Meller. You've got to help me. Stockwell closed his eyes, took a deep, shuddering breath. The savage silver of the cutthroat still glistened in his hand. The eyes of the severed head rolled, white showing, and fixed on the lethal weapon. Don't, don't, please don't hurt me. The voice was filled with panic and fear. Stockwell's eyes snapped open, confused. He observed the terror etched into the features of the head. Hurt him, for Christ's sakes, it's a severed head, a dead head. How the hell can I hurt that any more than it's already been hurt? Bulbous black clouds had gathered overhead, as if curious about the scene unfolding on the beach below. The wind had picked up yet more pace, blowing the long, lank black hair of the head this way and that. A devastating thought skewered itself into Stockwell's brain. This can't be happening. No matter how much I try to make sense of it, it just can't 
be happening. The head's not there. I'm seeing visions, hearing voices. No, no. I finally lost my mind is what's happening to me. A teardrop of blood trickled from the nick in Stockwell's neck, reminding him of the razor that nestled in his grip, snug as a lover's hand. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? I can't, won't answer. Stockwell's heart battered away in his breast. Sweat leaked from every pore, joined by droplets of rain as the gravid clouds finally gave way. Words invaded his brain in a now endless stream from the severed head, but the words held no meaning. May as well have been in a foreign language. He thought, I've got to get away from this thing. Stockwell scrambled to his feet, held the razor now to his wrist, and began to run and cut, run and cut. The screams of the head named Meller ringing in his ears. The watcher lounged in a soft armchair in the warmth and comfort of his own front room. A log fire roared eagerly in the Victorian fireplace. In his left hand, he held a tumbler of golden liquid, his finest malt whiskey. One tumbler full was already pleasantly heating the inside of his belly. In his right hand was the remote handset for his video. His index digit gently stroked the play button like a trigger finger on a Kalashnikov. The television screen crackled with static. Now, in a moment, he would depress the play button yet again and savor the details of the treasured video recording of his piece de resistance. He turned to his companion in the other armchair, smiling, and he said, Well, let's gorge ourselves upon the magnificent event once more, my friend. He activated the video without waiting for Stockwell to reply. The watcher gazed greedily at the flickering images of the incoming tide and the wild, shaking head. He happily absorbed the sounds of frenzied screaming that emitted from the junkie who had slaughtered his wife, slashing her throat for a few bucks, where the justice system had failed. He raised his glass to his lips. Cheers. I'll enjoy watching you drown a million times. The twin lights of madness and passion danced in his eyes. He had spoken to Stockwell only briefly, as he had run from the beach before collapsing. He would have liked to have known him longer. They had their grief in common, but it was too late. Stockwell stared at the screen, his eyes glassy. Blackened blood encrusted the dried-up gashes on his wrist. His skin, cold and pale. His body, statuesque. The effects of rigor mortis had stiffened all his sinews days before. Yet, the watcher was sure he detected the ghost of a smile on his lifeless face. The End